Tell us about a special displacement method. Okay. It means the moment we see two slides. Uh... Is it okay. okay? Yeah, fantastic. The floor can is you, yours. Can you see my mouse as well? Yeah, yeah, all good. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. So hello, everybody. I'm Mario Zacharias. I'm currently working uh, at Insaren with Jack Ivan. And today I'm going to talk about the spatial displacement method and how this methodology can incorporate efficiently electrophono coupling and harmonicity in non-perturbative suture cell calculations. So here is a short lecture summary of going, what I'm going to talk today. So first I will talk about non-perturbative approaches to electrophono coupling and also in harmonicity. And then I will show how we can go from the stochastic framework and Monte Carlo calculations to the deterministic framework to the point that we can use only a single configuration for evaluating electrophono properties or even unharmonic properties. Then I will introduce gradually the special displacement method, talk a little bit about the theory, its physical interpretation, and some of the applications that already exist in the literature. Uh, at the last part of my talk, I will talk about how we can generate self-consistent and harmonic special displacement methods, and then we can use these special displacements to evaluate unharmonic electrophono coupling. Uh, I will talk about the theory, uh, the validation of the theory, and also the methodology, and also some of the recent applications. So there are several codes in the literature for uh, doing temperature-dependent properties, uh, either rely on perturbative approaches or non-perturbative approaches. You have seen EPW, and also people might know Abinit that uh, these codes, they do temperature-dependent properties by evaluating the standard electrophono matrix elements from density function of perturbation theory within the single unit cell. In EPW, as Samuel uh, demonstrated and showed and explained, uh, we can do very interpolation and chain like electrophone matrix elements for very fine Q grids and do very accurate calculations. So there are also some other coaches that rely on supercell calculations and electrophone matrix elements are not evaluated explicitly. And we can incorporate the effect of electrophone coupling by displacing nuclei in large supercells. This code is VASP, which also implements the special displacement method, is the APW ZG code that I'm going to present today and also in the tutorials. Some other codes, they do path integral molecular dynamics or ab initial molecular dynamics like FHIAMs. So here is the special displacement method, which I represented in a snapshot. We start from the high symmetry structure where all the nuclei like as a, a static equilibrium, and we use all the phonomodes to displace the nuclei. Uh, and we get this uh, thermally displaced configuration. And we only choose only one configuration that best incorporates the effect of electrophono coupling. And I also borrow a figure from Feliciano's uh, tutorial uh, lecture on Monday, where he has shown the effect of, on the electronic structure by displacing the atoms along one particular phonon mode. What we do here is that we, we displace the nuclei deterministically along all phonon modes by choosing their displacements based on the Bose-Einstein occupation of these phonon modes for a particular temperature and taking into account the phonon frequency. So we will indeed see an effect on the electronic structure, but this will be more systematic. So why is the special displacement method useful compared to perturbative approaches? So some perturbative approaches, they might involve a very complex theory, which might be very difficult to derive. Also, we need to implement this complex theory, and this might be even more complex. And sometimes we have the problem that unharmonicity is there, and it's very, and makes the whole story even more difficult. We need to compute the electrophone matrix elements uh, explicitly and also do veneer interpolation, which have people know that basically is not as trivial. Uh, it's not that trivial, actually. And also, there are some missing terms in perturbation theory, which might be important, like electron multiphone effects captured from higher order terms. So the way I like to, to describe the special displacement method is like the Alexander uh, the Great, who actually solved the Gordian note, and he said, what cannot be resolved, it is cut. So the special displacement method is an, a simple approach where we displace nuclei and we use only one configuration to evaluate temperature dependent properties. However, the special displacement method has its own drawbacks because uh, it relies it's an adiabatic uh, theory and we cannot capture any non-adiabatic effects that Feliciano or Samuel uh, discussed in their tutorials. 
So the common goal of all non perturbative supercell approaches is effectively to evaluate the temperature dependence of this physical observable, which can be written as a thermal average, which can be expressed as a trace over the complete set of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, weighted by the standard Boltzmann factor here. And here we have also the partition function zeta. So if we replace the physical observable with the standard transition rate from an electron state alpha to a final electron state beta, and, exp and expand the trace, we can rate it as a summation overall nuclear states. Here, the exponential factor is a standard Boltzmann factor, and we have possible transitions from the initial states to the final states. So this is the expression that all perturbative, non-perturbative approaches are seeking to evaluate. And here we have uh, some perturbative approaches that rely on the path integral representation of, of quantum mechanics based on, on Feynman's theory and we call it path integral molecular dynamics. Though, so those approaches are very accurate, but sometimes uh, they are uh, very uh, very compute expensive computationally to calculate. And this, uh, these approaches have been used only for small molecules. One can also use ab initial molecular dynamics, but here we are missing uh, quantum nuclear effects. Some other approaches, which are even more sophisticated, rely on path integral for the nuclei and quantum Monte Carlo for the electrons. Again, these approaches have been used only for uh, small molecules. And some other approaches which have been applied for solids and are very efficient, uh, rely on the important sampling Monte Carlo methodology, where we draw nuclear coordinates from a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And from there, we can evaluate either electron phonon properties, or sometimes we can evaluate even unharmonic lattice dynamics. So here I refer you that all these links are uh, hyperlinked. So if you uh, click on, on these links in the presentation, you can find the associated references. So coming back to my presentation and the special displacement method. So in the special displacement method, we don't really need the important sampling Monte Carlo, and we deter and we and we generate a, a single supercell configuration deterministically. This has been applied for the case of electrophono coupling, and recently we extended the theory for doing unharmonic lattice dynamics. Some other approaches, non-perturbative approaches, rely on standard finite differences or thermal lines, where this last uh, category is also very efficient to do electrophone coupling effects. So why is the special displacement useful compared to MD or molecular dynamic or Monte Carlo approaches? Uh, so for compared to molecular dynamics, we need to do the equilibration state. We are missing the quantum nuclei effects and also sometimes the computational cost, especially if we are increasing the super size, is very high. Uh, compared to Monte Carlo or molecular dynamics, how many configurations do we need to, 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 to obtain for getting an, a, an accurate result? So if by any chance we hit a problematic configuration, we always need to generate more and more configurations to compensate for this error. In the special displacement method, we don't have this problem. So in principle, all non-perturbative approaches can be upgraded to evaluate any property that can be written as a Fermi Golden Rule. Today I will talk about temperature dependent bound structures and phonon assisted optical spectra, but also other people have employed the special displacement method to do tunneling spectra or even transport coefficients and mobilities. Here is the first example of phonon assisted optical absorption, which has been covered by Kibagis in his lecture yesterday. And here we see the two figures from his paper with Nofsinger back in 2012, where they have investigated the phonon assisted transition, transitions in silicon. So the expression that uh, describes phonon assisted transition is developed by Holbart in a blood back in 1950s. And here we have inside the square modulus, the two terms that describe the two possible paths that the electron can follow to complete an indirect transition. P is for the optical matrix elements representing a direct transition, and G is for the electrophonon matrix elements, uh, basically connecting an indirect transition in the conduction band or in the valve band. On the denominators, we have the consham energies and the photo frequencies, and also the phonon energies. Inside the delta function, we have basically the energies and the photo frequency and the phonon energy in order to ensure energy con conservation. So by using this uh, equation, evaluating this equation in silicon back in 2012, the authors of this work, they obtained excellent agreement with experiment. However, in order to match the experimental absorption onset, they have to rigidly shift their spectra. And this is because uh, when they do the calculations, 
inside the delta function, the temperature dependence of the energy levels doesn't enter. So we cannot account for the shift of the band structure, uh, for the effect of the shift of the band structure on the optical spectra. So another theory that accounts for temperature dependent uh, energy levels is the allen eine theory, whose per two body expression is given here. Inside the square modulus, we have the first term, which is the uh, fan self energy term. And then we have the standard electrophone matrix elements and the Consham energies. And the second term is the debye waller term, which depends on second order variations of the self consistent potential with respect to the nuclear coordinates. N stands for the standard Bose Einstein occupation factor at temperature T. So this expression is quite famous in the literature and has been used to evaluate temperature dependent bound structures for several systems. And I, I list a few publications here actually. Uh, one of famous figure uh, from Samuel Ponce work uh, back in 2015 is the effect of the zero point motion on the electronic structure uh, of silicon. Here we see that we have temperature zero Kelvin. So even at zero Kelvin, the, uh, the nuclei are vibrating due to the effect of zero point motion. So by using the temperature equals zero is that we don't have the Bose-Einstein incubation here, but still we have a renormalization coming from the allen eine theory. So if we account for this allen eine theory, we'll see that the energy of the valence band goes higher in energy, while uh, the energy of the conduction band goes lower in energy. So, if we th uh, so this will lead to an overall band gap closing. And if we think in terms of optical absorption, this band gap closing, if we enter about the, this correction inside the delta function, will capture correctly the experimental absorption onset. Also, if we consider higher temperatures, here I show the example of gallium arsenide, we will see that the effect of band gap closing becomes more prominent. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the williams lacks theory, which is a unified theory that accounts for both phono-assisted optical absorption and temperature-dependent band structures at the same level of theory I have described before. The starting point of the williams lacks theory is the Heisberg teller rate, where we can write the transition rate as a summation over all finer nuclear states represented by chi. P represents optical transitions between the electronic states and the delta function again ensures uh, energy conservation. So E vita M here stands for the joint electron nuclear energy. So this object is very difficult to evaluate. So Williams and Lux did the semi-classical approximation and they have replaced the joint electron nuclear energy by the adiabatic potential energy surface. This allows to perform the summation, to employ the harmonic approximation and reach to this compact expression for the imaginary part of the dielectric function. So with this expression, one can evaluate using Porter sampling Monte Carlo. Uh, the spectra is a weighted average with the nuclei fixed in a variety of configurations. The nuclei are drawn from this uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution. So the coordinates are represented by X nu, and the widths of the Gaussians correspond to the mean square displacement of the atoms along a particular phonon mode. And the dielectric function is evaluated for a particular configuration. We choose for simplicity to represent the dielectric function in the independent particle picture, so we can focus on the effect of electrophono coupling. So here is uh, the case of silicon optical absorption, and we apply the williams lacks theory for silicon. And first, we show the experiment. Now our calculations by using only the theory direct. Theory direct means that we fix the nuclear static equilibrium, so we don't account for any thermal vibrations and we evaluate the, the absorption coefficient. We see that we have no absorption uh, essentially below the fundamental direct gap. But if we use the williams lux theory and we incorporate effects, thermal effects uh, by displacing the nuclei using the portal sampling Monte Carlo technique I described before, we can see that we can capture correctly indirect optical absorption and the correct absorption onset. Some deviation between theory and experiment is mostly attributed to the fact that we are not accounting for excitonic effects in our calculations. So now I comment about uh, the convergence with respect to the configuration of sampling. So we found that by increasing the super size, we found that we need less and less configurations to obtain convergence. And in fact, here I show the, uh, the, the result for six configurations in an eight by eight by eight supercell of silicon. That would be 1,024 atoms. So even if we use only one configuration, we found that this configuration will do the job. And actually we were like very excited about this result. And we said, okay, can we do all calculations with one configuration? 
And we said, okay, let's do the maths. And the maths, they were quite simple, let's say, because we need just to expand the dielectric function as a Taylor expansion and perform this multivariate Gaussian integration and obtain this exact result for the williams lacks dielectric function. So if we were to do the calculation using only one configuration, the first trivial choice is to set the normal coordinates to be equal to this sigma, the mean square displacement of the atoms uh, along each phonon mode. And we end up with this equation here. So what's the difference between these two equations is these cross coupling terms uh, for different phonon modes entering the, these second order uh, coefficients. So the trivial choice here is just to put all the phonon modes energetically ordered and start changing alternating the signs between plus and minus, plus and minus. So in the limit of a large supercell, these consecutive coefficients will be very similar and they will enter the summation with a different sign and they will cancel each other. And we can reproduce the exact williams lacks electric function. Let me note also that if you do the Taylor expansion, you can also obtain higher order terms, but for simplicity here, we keep the discussion up to second order in nuclear coordinates, but the same conclusions can be drawn for higher order terms. Uh, and also in, in, the, in our paper in 2016, we have proved that indeed uh, these ZG configurations, uh, they will give the exact williams lacks the electric function. And for generating the special displacements, we need to consider the normal coordinate transformation equation and plug in this choice of the signs in, the, in, the, in this expression. So now coming uh, for the validation for the special displacement method, the first validation, we did that for silicon and the phonon assisted spectra of diamond. And we see that in both cases, we capture correctly by red, the phonon assisted optical absorption. We capture the co correct, uh, uh, experimental absorption onset in both cases, and some deviations between theory and experiment is mainly attributed to the fact that we are using the independent particle picture. We will see how to do phonon assisted optical absorption calculations in exercise four of the tutorial. So now some uh, relations that they make a link between non-perturbative and perturbative approaches. Uh, as I said before, in the William Black theory, we have these second order coefficients. So these second order coefficients can be evaluated either by finite differences or they are implicitly evaluated in the special displacement method. So how are these coefficients connected with perturbation theory? In fact, if we do oh, a perturbation theory for this object here and expand the electron wave functions via perturbation theory, first order perturbation theory, we, second order perturbation theory, we will end up to this expression, which is almost identical to the whole part in a blood uh, expression for phonon assisted transition rates. We can also do the same for temperature dependent bound structures and recover the Allen Ayn theory. What is the problem here for the non perturbative methods is that we, we, we don't account for non adiabatic effects and we don't have the phonon frequencies in the denominators uh, uh, or the delta function. So this approximation should be okay for a, uh, a material with a large band gap, fairly large band gap compared to the phonon frequencies in the system. However, on the positive side, we can capture all, all coefficients beyond the uh, second order. So we include electron multiphonon effects. We also include off diagonal the by waller contributions, and we don't rely on the rigid ion approximation, which is a very useful approximation when you do perturbative calculations in the allen Ayn theory for evaluating the de waller term. So back in 2020, we did we said, okay, let's do it even more properly and develop a reciprocal space formulation so we can generate the special displacements uh, by using only quantities evaluated from density functional perturbation theory. So again, here we have the expression for the special displacements, but using also the, the, the phono wave vectors because we do a reciprocal space formulation. MP stands for the mass, uh, it's a reference mass that we usually take as a proton mass. MK is the masses of the atomic nuclei and NP is the number of unit cells contained within our supercell. Uh, the summation goes over Q points that belong in set B, which I will describe later what is this set B. We have also signs which are allocated by the EPW ZG module, so we minimize an error function that we will also discuss later. And we have this sigma, the mean square displacement of the atoms, uh, which is depends on the Bose-Einstein occupation factor divided by the phonon frequency. 
So this is the expression implemented in the ZG module of Quantum Espresso, and you can generate uh, ZG configurations from there and evaluate temperature-dependent properties. So coming back to the partitioning of, of reciprocal space in, in Q points belonging in set A, B, and C. So Q points in set A are those Q points that the time reversal partners are themselves. So, and we choose to exclude these Q points in the generation of the ZG displacements because sometimes uh, they will be problematic and, and basically induce in a, a, a numerical error in our calculations. Uh, points is set B are those that they do not have any time reversal partner and their time reversal pa partners, we group them in, in group C actually. So if we do the calculation for Q points in set B and set C, we'll get the same result. And that's why we use a factor of two here. So basically in this way, we can minimize the computational effort for generating uh, special displacements by a factor of two. And another key finding that we found uh, during our reciprocal space formulation uh, is that due to periodicity in the solids, the linear order derivatives vanish, and we should not worry uh, about those for minimizing the error in supercell calculations. Uh, in addition, all the second order derivatives, which have a different, uh, which correspond to normal coordinates for a different wave vector, vanish in a supercell calculation. So what we need to worry actually is for these cross-coupling terms that belong to different phonon branches. So this will simplify a lot of the procedure for minimizing the error coming from these cross-coupling terms that we have discussed before, if we want to do the calculation with only one configuration. And this is, in fact, the, the error function that we found and we seek to minimize to generate uh, special displacements. So in the code, we simply said compute error true. We set the threshold to 5%, for example, this is a very tight threshold. Someone can use also 10 or 20%, it should be fine. And we'll see how to do that in exercise one. So the code will try to allocate signs uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a combinatorial manner uh, and up to the point that we get lower to this threshold for this error function. And then we'll generate the ZG configuration. So this equation is very important because for computing this object here, we can do that uh, very efficiently because all quantities here are computed from density functional perturbation theory, and we don't need any extra DFT calculations to generate the optimum configuration. Uh, another point is that uh, for this, for being meaningful to apply it to generate signs and minimize the error function very efficiently, we need to apply a smooth berry-face uh, on my our, our phonon eigenvectors, phonon polarization vectors. So here, what we do, we apply transformation. This is a unitary transformation determined by singular value decomposition. And we do that as we move along a path. We choose the path that ensures locality between the phonon modes and phonon polarization vectors, meaning that they are very close to each other. And we see that before uh, doing the, the smooth gouge procedure and before applying a berry phase, a smooth berry phase, we see that the phonon modes are indicating in random directions. But after we do that, we see that all uh, phonon eigenvectors are correctly aligned. So again, this figure uh, is that the physical meaning of minimizing this error function, it will give the best optimum configuration I will generate the special displacement methods to incorporate the effect of electrophonic coupling in ab initio non perturbative calculations. So here's the high symmetry structure. We displace the nuclei and we can capture electrophonic uh, coupling effects, electrophonic properties. Here's a, a, a nice example that I would like to use to demonstrate the significance of these uh, uh, special displacements is, uh, is, uh, is that we can reproduce uh, exactly uh, electron diffraction patterns. So imagine that an electron scatters inelastically from the sample. So this will create or annihilate uh, some phonons in the sample. And then we can capture the scattered, uh, um, and we can capture the scatter intensity in the detector. What we will see is the so-called diffuse scattering pattern. So in the diffuse scattering pattern, we'll have Bragg scattering and also the inelastic scattering, which is represented by red here. So inelastic scattering is due to phonons. And here we use the example of the, uh, the diffuse scattering patterns of black phosphorus, and we split the calculation into one phonon and multi-phonon contributions. So if we sum the two, we will get the so-called all phonon contribution. 
So now coming to the spatial displacement methods for, for evaluating the, uh, the scattering intensity uh, using the ZG configuration, we use a very simple formula that it, it exists in every solid state physics book is the is basically for evaluating the scattering intensity. And we do the summation overall unit cells in the supercell overall atoms. We use the atomic scattering factor and we have this phase factor, which involves the dot product between the scattering wave vector and information about the position of the nuclei. RP would be the real lattice vector, TK is the position of the nuclei at equilibrium, and delta tau are the spatial displacements. With that, incorporate the effect uh, of phonons on the diffuse scattering. So without the spatial displacements, what we'll get is only the Bragg peaks. By including our spatial displacements in the calculation of the scattering intensity, we see that we will produce the all phonon result, the exact result, and also we have excellent agreement with experiment. So this is another example to demonstrate that these displacements will give the best collection of scatterers that best reproduce phonon induced in elastic scattering patterns, but also to show that they will account for multi phonon effects. So they will account for terms beyond second order in our Taylor expansion with respect to nuclear coordinates. So other applications of the special displacement method involve the calculation of full temperature dependent band structures. Uh, since we are using supercells, if we want to, uh, to calculate the uh, temperature dependent band structures, we need to do phononal faulting. So here I use the example of a 222 supercell. So we see that the Brillouin zone will become smaller in a larger supercell. So we need to unfold the bands in order to obtain information in the fundamental uh, Brillouin zone of the system. And if we imagine that we displacing atoms, this will have a renormalization as also Phil Chano shown in his slide four that I have put in my introduction. We'll capture this renormalization. And here is the effect uh, of, of temperature dependent band structures uh, for the case of silicon at 300 Kelvin. Uh, here is the implementation. So the goal is to evaluate the electros electrospectral function effectively in the Lehman representation as also Phil Chano introduced and what we need to evaluate here is the spectral weights which this object it's the most important object for doing band structure and faulting depends only on the plane wave coefficients uh, evaluated in the zg supercell calculation so what is this equation saying is that we need to to evaluate these plane co wave coefficients co for wave vectors that map back into the unit cell by, uh, by plus minus a reciprocal lattice vector of the unit cell. So this is the expression implemented in Bansanfold.x and it works for non-conserving pseudopotentials, ultrasoft or power pseudopotentials. And we will learn how to do that uh, in, the, in the exercise two of the tutorial. Here I also show the, sorry about this. Here I also show the example of temperature dependent band structures of molybdenum disulfide. And in our calculations, we all can also include the effect of spin orbit coupling. Uh, some other applications of the special displacement method involve the calculation of current density of finite temperatures, open circuit voltage, also evaluate the zero point effect, uh, even with higher level approaches like GW or hybrid functionals. Here, the group of Kresse in Vienna have used this approach to evaluate the zero point normalization uh, in several semiconductors and they plotted it versus the mean phono frequency for this particular case. Also, uh, people have, done, have used the methodology to evaluate uh, temperature dependent band gaps for, for more complex systems like uh, metal halide perovskites or other perovskites. Uh, the method can, can be used also for nanostructures. So I think this is, is if we want to include electrophono coupling effects in large molecules and nanostructures, uh, the special displacement method will be the most efficient way to go. And also has been used to evaluate intergroupical absorption in this uh, perovskite oxide, and also to evaluate phono-assisted emission spectrum uh, using the Van Roosbeck Shockley relationship and the principle of detailed balance. These calculations have been performed by Wenchol uh, Lee uh, in the group of Manos Kibagis. And I think Kibagis also discussed about this figure yesterday. Uh, other applications, very interesting applications, is that we can do exit of phono coupling uh, uh, with a special displacement method. Here is the case of 2D germanium selenite. We see that if we incorporate the effect of exit of phono coupling in our calculations, we'll see that uh, the dashed line 
red shifts, I said, because of the accounting for the temperature dependent energy levels, and also the oscillator strengths and the uh, scattering and the amplitude of the peak is decreased, actually. Uh, for regarding the X-ray absorption spectra in hexagonal boron nitride, we see that if we account for zero point motion, zero point vibrational effects integrated by this line, we can recover this double peak structure observed in the experiments. Again, coming back to nanostructures, here we have the case of graphene quantum dots. We can use a special displacement method and find very interesting uh, scaling rules for the zero point renormalization or even do band structure forcing and reveal the, how the band structure will look like in a graphene quantum dot. Uh, now coming to the story of unharmonicity, how we can incorporate unharmonicity using the harmonic special displacement method. Uh, this is how I like to, to describe it. Uh, so accounting for our harmonic effects, it's a challenging thing. So if we have uh, the potential energy surface as a function of the displacement of the atoms. If it's a parabola, we can always use a harmonic approximation and density functional perturbation theory and compute the phonons. This can also apply for weakly unharmonic systems, but for unharmonic systems, like in those two cases here that I show schematically, the harmonic approximation will break down and give uh, imaginary phonon frequencies, which usually appear as negative frequencies in the phonon dose. There are several approaches for doing this. State of, and the state-of-the-art methods are the TDEV methodology, which relies on ab initial molecular dynamics by Ole Hellman, the stochastic self-consistent harmonic approximation developed by Ion Herrera and collaborators, uh, which relies on important sampling on the Carlo of drawing configurations from a multivariate Gaussian distribution and solving the system-free energy self-consistently to capture unharmonicity in the system. And also there are some other approaches that rely on perturbation theory. And by perturbation theory here, I mean that the higher order interatomic force constants are calculated explicitly using finite differences. And then you plug them in in the evaluation of the phono self-energy and you can get the phono renormalization coming from these equations. So I said the TDEP and the SHA methodologies rely on similar principles with the special displacement method. And in fact, they are brothers and sisters with the special displacement method. And I said, can we do it uh, also with the special displacement method and upgrade this methodology? So we went back to the theory and we said, okay, we want to compute temperature dependent effective interatomic force constants. And this has to be done iteratively until we obtain self-consistency in the interatomic force constant matrices evaluated at a particular temperature T. So here we have also the second derivative of the potential energy surface with respect to the nuclear coordinates. And this uh, bracket it represents essentially the thermal average for a particular temperature. So the proof of this object that needs to be solved self-consistently involves minimizing the trial free energy of the system with respect to the matrix of interatomic force constants. So the free energy can be written as a sum of the a thermal average, uh, basically of the true FA, of the true potential minus um, here basically all eigenstates are taken with respect to the Hamiltonian of the effective harmonic system. Here is the vibrational energy of this system, and also we have the vibrational free energy. If we expand these expressions and we obtain an explicit expression with respect to the phonon frequency and also the Bose-Einstein occupation factor and the temperature, and we perform the derivative with respect to the interatomic force constants, we are seeking for a solution that, uh, that gives zero basically for the free energy, for the derivative of the free energy with respect to the interatomic force constants. So we can prove by doing uh, some algebra that we can end up with this equation. And this equation says that if we want to find this solution, we need to set the interatomic force constants equal to this object and solve this self consistently. If we are, look, if we are looking for more details about this derivation, I, uh, I invite you to go to this archive paper and, and look the derivation there. So now we are showing schematically what is this effective potential. This effective potential will coincide with the, with the true potential if the true potential is a harmonic approximation. So we don't need really, we need to do a, an effective potential for these cases. However, if we have unharmonicity, and here I use the example of a double well potential, 
if we apply harmonic approximation at the local maximum, we can see that this harmonic approximation will completely break that down and will not be able to, to describe the exact nuclear Schrodinger equation, the exact solution of the nuclear Schrodinger equation. We can always put, make a, a harmonic approximation at the local minimum here and obtain a reasonable result, but we have no indication how accurate is the result by doing a harmonic approximation at the local minimum here. Instead, we have to do an effective potential that we solve iteratively until we obtain convergence. And the convergence, the solution of this converged result will be very close to the exact solution of the Schrodinger nuclear equation. Here, I use the terminology monomorphous and polymorphous for these two cases. And I adapt the terminology from uh, Zunger Group uh, in Colorado, uh, where they did this famous paper about the polymorphous nature of metal halide perovskites. So for high symmetry or monomorphous, I refer to when the atoms are at their uh, weak of positions. And, and in fact, for a perovskite, this will be a local maximum. However, we need to determine the ground state energy of the system. And for doing so, we can relax the structure and obtain a locally disordered network that has no symmetries. And we refer to this network that uh, gives the ground state of, of the system as the polymorphous network. So why is this useful? Is because the starting point of the self-consistent phonon theory uh, should be a positive then infinite interatomic force constant. And we'll see how we cannot do that. So, our aim is to compute temperature-dependent effective interatomic force constants. And we, what we do here, we replace the thermal average with the ZG configuration. So we want to generate the ZG configuration and evaluate this object iteratively until we obtain self-consistency in the phonons. So the first step is to compute the harmonic phonons of the polymorphous structure. So now we are basically here for the harmonic approximation. And using finite differences, we enforce the symmetries and obtain an initial set for the phono frequencies and phono polarization vectors that we call polymorphous symmetrized because we apply the symmetries on the phonons. And what we will get here is that we indeed get stable phonons represented by the red line compared to the monomorphous structure, which has very uh, a lot of instabilities for the case of strontium titanite. But we need to stress that our calculations so far, they have no temperature dependence. The temperature dependence enters by generating ZG configurations. So we use the well-defined phonons obtained for the polymorphous structure, and we generate special displacements. We generate our uh, ZG configuration. We compute the teradomic force constants using finite differences. We enforce the symmetries of, of the crystal to the uh, object of, uh, to the matrix of interatomic force constants, and we calculate temperature dependent uh, phono frequencies and phono polarization vectors. We do that, we repeat the steps three to five until we obtain cell consistency. And by, for speeding up the procedure, we found that if we do iterative mixing between the iteratomic force constants, uh, this speeds up the procedure uh, by a large factor, actually. So here is the figures demonstrating the, the convergence performance of the ASDM. Uh, here, the, with the green, we have the monomorphous uh, phonon, the phonon dispersion obtained for the monomorphous structure. It's the harmonic approximation. We have many instabilities along the whole reciprocal uh, path, and we account for the polymorphous structure. We get a positive definite interatomic force constant, and from there, we can start the iterative procedure for capturing temperature-dependent unharmonic phonons. In the red, I represent it as iteration zero. So we go to iteration one, where we generate the ZG configuration, we compute the iteratomic force constants, and we evaluate the phonons after applying the symmetries. We do that iteratively, and we see that up to iteration five, we have full convergence. But even if you see the gray line here, uh, we see that the result is fairly converged. So even if you use only a few steps in this procedure, you can get temperature dependent and harmonic phonons very efficiently. We also demonstrate the convergence of the free energy of the system with a number of iterations. And also we evaluate the frobenium, frobenium's norm of the leading component of the teratomic force constant matrix. So this is something that you will see also in the tutorial how to calculate. Uh, here is the case of, of zirconium. We did for a very high for very high temperatures the phonon dispersion of zirconium, and we see that we obtain excellent agreement with the experiment across the entire uh, reciprocal space. And we we learn how to evaluate uh, uh, unharmonic phonon dispersions of zirconium 
uh, in, the in exercise three of our tutorial. Uh, now coming to the next result and how this methodology compares with a, uh, the TDEP uh, or the stochastic self-consistent harmonic approximation of the self-consistent phono theory using perturbation theory. So the ASTM, which I use color diamonds to represent it, and here the green corresponds to the calculations using the tetragonal structure of strontium titanite, and blue is the is calculations for the cubic uh, strontium titanite. And what I calculate here is the phono frequency of the transverse optical modes at gamma point as a function of temperature. So what we see here is that all methodologies agree uh, to a good extent, and that actually validates uh, the special displacement method, which is in fact at the same level of theory uh, with all these approaches. Of course, in the SHA methodology, someone can include also the static bubble diagram, which includes some extra normalization in the phonon frequencies, but that should be important for systems uh, with very light atoms like hydrates, for example. Uh, in this reference here by Carla Berti, they found out that if they include uh, uh, the random phase approximation in, uh, in their calculations, so all these calculations here I, rep I represented, they use DFT PV sol. So in this uh, publication here, they found out that if they use the random phase approximation, they can bring these points down to the experiment and explain the experiment. But all these uh, calculations grants uh, uh, further investigation, basically to, with respect to the convergence of the supercell size and other factors. Uh, so now, can we apply the harmonic special displacement method, generate unharmonic special displacements, and evaluate unharmonic electrophono coupling uh, in unharmonic in materials? Yes, we can do. And this is very trivial to do, actually, after we have the self-consistent and harmonic phonons. We have here the band gap normalization for the case of strontium titanite and cesium lead bromide. For now, I want you to focus on the blue dots and to see that we have excellent agreement with experiment. Here in, our, in, in my plot, I also uh, compare uh, the high symmetry and the polymorphous uh, structure, the distorted structure. So that is if we displace atoms using a harmonic phonon starting from the high symmetry structure or from the polymorphous structure, we see that the polymorphous structure will generate more precise results using the harmonic uh, phonons evaluated with, from the special displacement method for strontium titanite and also for cesium lead bromide. This is for the cubic phase and that's why we keep temperatures up to 400 Kelvin. And another important bit is that if we use different phases, so the special displacement method, the harmonic special displacement method can be, can be applied also for different phases, the tetragonal or the cubic. So here the tetragonal phase will have 10 atoms in the unit cell. We can build a supercell generate a, a harmonic special displacements and evaluate again the band gap at finite temperatures. Here we also corrected our band gaps using PV0 corrections. And we can see again that we have an excellent agreement with the experiment. And the reason we have this smooth variation for the distorted structure while for the high symmetry structure, we don't have that is because in the high symmetry structure, we use a monomorphous network and that will give a jump in the band gap of the system. So it's better when you want to explore uh, a, a harmonic electrophono coupling in polymorphous perovskites, in perovskites to use the polymorphous network as a reference point instead of the monomorphous frame, uh, uh, network. And this brought, uh, yeah, yeah, brought me to my conclusions. Basically, the special displacement method is a very simple and efficient methodology for capturing unharmonicity and electrophono coupling effects in up initial calculations. Using the links here, you can find also tutorials online and the input plugs. So if I click here, we are redirected in the input plugs page uh, for ZG calculations. And I included also information about the ASDM actually. Uh, what we have seen here is that the special displacement method is not a simple uh, numerical trick, but encloses some important physics and it has the potential for evaluating other temperature-dependent observables other than phono-assisted optical absorption or temperature-dependent band gaps like uh, conductivity, tunnel spectra, or exciton spectra. So all these need to be explored. Uh, also, the unharmonic special displacement method will give uh, unharmonic phonons in good agreement with the TDEP, the SHA, 
or the CPPT, and uh, especially for when we are evaluating second order uh, effective interatomic force constants. All these methodologies rely on the same theory, the self consistent Fano theory developed back in the 1950s. And finally, a temperature dependent and harmonic interatomic force constants could be interfaced with MPW, and this should be within reach in the near future. And so I would like to thank you for your attention, my funding sources, and I will let you also with a few references. Uh, so the first four references, uh, the first three references are about non perturbative calculations and the special displacement method and how this, how, how we can incorporate the effect of electron coupling efficiently. Uh, the fourth reference is for doing the ASDM. Uh, reference five it is a very nice reference by Raffaello Bianco and the group of Maori in Rome, where they have shown basically they discuss uh, all the aspects of the self consistent phono theory and how we can go beyond by evaluating derivatives of the free energy uh, very accurately. And finally, is the EPW technical paper, which is on archive. So I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Marius, for this uh, very good talk, very instructive. Uh, I think we have time for, for some questions. Um, can you see uh, the Q&A and can you go through them or do you want me to read them for you? No, it's fine. So questions for, for Marius, when you talk about the thin dependent band structures, which theory you used? Is it the dynamical mean field theory and how you control the temperature? So we use density functional theory and the way we control the temperature, so the temperature will enter only via the Bose-Einstein occupation factor for the phonons. And this will tell you by how much you are displacing the phonons in your super structure. So if I come back to the, yeah, this expression here. So this is basically the displacements of the atoms, which depends on the Bose-Einstein uh, uh, occupation factor and the phonon frequency. And this will tell me by how much, based on the temperature that I want to do my calculations for, I will displace my nuclei. And this will incorporate the correct effect of electrophono coupling uh, uh, for the particular temperature of choice. Uh, now, what is the difference between epsilon vs energy obtaining from epsilon dot x pw and epw? So the only difference between epsilon dot x that I have in the ZG holder is that we do Gaussian broadening. Because in, in, in quantum espresso epsilon dot x, they do Lorentzian broadening. And uh, when you do Lorentzian broadening to investigate phono assisted op optical absorption, will give a, a, an erroneous tail close to the absorption onset, uh, which is not physical actually. So we choose to, to represent this, uh, this uh, like the uh, indirect optical absorption with the Gaussian, which has which doesn't give any sp spurious artifacts uh, tails close to the absorption onset actually. On slide six, do you? to an average between six configurations, if it's six. Okay, I guess we are talking about 16, okay. Uh, yes, here it's an average using the important sampling. So I generate six configurations to evaluate this expression. And we found that if we are increasing the super size, we need less and less configurations. Uh, basically, and here I show the average with six configurations, which is already well converged. And even if you use one configuration, you can do the job. Uh, okay, for a given system, it says DM computationally faster compared to DFPT for getting electron interaction elements. So with SDM, we don't evaluate the electron matrix elements explicitly. This can be done with density functional perturbation theory. And I think this is the fastest way you can do it. And then by using EPW, you can do any interpolation and get uh, very fast, uh, uh, like electrophonic matrix elements. So, the so one of the drawbacks of these non perturbative approaches is that we don't have uh, any approach that we one can also compute with finite differences electrophonic matrix elements, but this is very complicated, a very complicated procedure. The best way is to do density functional perturbation theory in the unit cell. Uh, but yeah, these non perturbative approaches, we never evaluate explicitly the quantities. We we just find the, the, the observable of interest. We find the equation for this observable of interest. And we don't worry about the equation 
the perturbative expression for electrophono coupling. We just displace the nuclei and we evaluate that expression, that observable, and we include the effect of electrophono coupling in our calculations. Uh, how big do we need to make our supercell for large volume, say 40 atoms unit cells? For large volume. Okay, okay. Is this a criteria for choosing how large the supercell are meant to be? So the best answer here is that you check you check systematically for convergence. The way you check systematically for convergence for the K grid or the Q grid, if you are phonon dispersions. This is the same way you do the SDM calculation. So you are increasing systematically uh, uh, your supercell uh, size. Now coming to a unit cell of 40 atoms, uh, I guess if you do two by two by two in this 40 atoms unit cell, I, I guess you'll get something reasonable, but of course you need to go a little bit higher to see if you have convergence, but this is the best you can do and you get a reasonable result, you can survive with this result. I think it should be okay. Practically, how is spin orbit coupling accounted for in SDM? So that's the benefit of the special displacement method. Or, or if you are talking how we can include spin orbit coupling for computing the phonons for generated special displacements, uh, one can do finite differences and turn on spin orbit coupling in the in you know in a DFT code. Also for special displacement, after you generate special displacements, you can use this configuration and turn on spin orbit coupling when you do the self consistent field calculation very easily. So that's the benefit of the special displacement method. You don't need to worry about any other implementations because these implementations have been already done in a standard DFT code like quantum espresso. Uh, can SDM be used in defect systems? Yes, it can be used and that would be a nice application of the special displacement method, but just be careful that you generate correct phonons and you generate uh, the displacements from the phonons for the system with a defect. Uh, you, 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 we use polymorphous structure just for solving the problem of having a non-positive definite guess for self-consistency, or is there something more? When you get to polymorphous structure, you may easily break your symmetry. While you will be interested in specific more about obtaining definite guess as an unstable material they extend. So the self-consistent phono theory, the way it is designed, if you go through the maths, it works only with positive definite interatomic force constants. If you choose by any reason, you know, to set these frequencies to positive and go ahead, this has some risk because if you hit a phono frequency that is very close to the instability or to the point that it becomes negative, actually, uh, then you can generate a very silly configuration that will lead you to a very wrong direction and not to self-consistency. We found that using the polymorphic structure and we apply the symmetries at the end of the day, we'll always give something positive definite. Okay, so this approximation can also be very good for a system with not a big potential well depth. But even if you use, so, but for our case, we just use the polymorphic structure to initiate the procedure to obtain well-defined phono frequencies and phono polarization vectors to do the ASDM. Uh, in the figures here that I have described, it's another application of the polymorphous structure. We found that if we start all the displacements using the ASDM until we obtain convergence, and we use and we start displacing the atoms from the polymorphous structure, you will, we obtain a very interesting result that we, we reproduce better the experiment instead of using the high symmetry structure. But this is for the effect of our harmonic electrophono coupling. It has nothing to do in the symmetrization procedure for the phones here. Uh, uh, do I have time, Daniel? Yeah, yeah, you, you have still five minutes. You can answer the last three questions, I think. You use a cubic cell or a tetragonal cell because at low temperature we can't handle it. Yeah, okay. That's very good question. Sorry, I didn't clarify. It's also very late in France. Uh, uh, it's tight tonight. So yeah, here I use for computing these points, I use the tetragonal structure. So, and then beyond this temperature, I use the cubic structure. Also, if you see here, I have the blue dots for the cubic structure. I would just wanted to see what I will get if I do the cubic structure for a low temperature. And in fact, for the zero Kelvin result using the cubic structure, I will get instabilities basically in my calculation. And that's why someone needs to use the tetragonal structure. 
And if you are asking about the band gap renormalization, I again use the phonons of the tetragonal structure and I displace my atoms starting from the tetragonal structure. Uh, with this, okay, and how are the harmonic ST for electrophonon generally if you do not have a separable bosonic Hamiltonian? Uh, thank you for the amazing work. Uh, okay. Uh, we do have, so at the end of the day, the subconsistent phonon theory works to generate basically uh, independent quantum harmonic oscillators, and the harmonicity is incorporated in the phonon frequencies, the real part of the phonon self energy, and the phonon polarization vectors. So, still, our Hamiltonian is a parable, and we can generate uh, special displacements uh, using. Uh, the procedure I described in the self-consistent phonon theory. This is at the same level again with the SHA. The SHA will also generate uh, uh, phonon frequencies that at the end of the day, we have independent quantum harmonic oscillators that carry effectively the harmonicity of the system. Uh, could you please comment on the superside dependence when including the ZG displacements? As I said before, we need to always to do uh, systematically. We need to test the size convergence systematically. So we go from one 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 to two 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 three 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 four four four, and we check for convergence. Uh, how the sign modification mode contribution results in gauge fixing? It will hurt if you could elaborate on it more for a physical intuitive understanding. Great work, thanks. Um, so the intuitive way, maybe I, I don't have it, let's say. What I have here is that uh, we need to apply a smooth gouge. And the reason we need to apply a smooth gouge is because determining signs, uh, okay, the, 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 the goal here is to minimize this function. Either we apply uh, this procedure for the smooth berry connection, uh, at the end of the day, the code will indeed minimize this error function and will give and will print out the ZG configuration. But in order to do it more systematically and faster, we chose to apply this smooth berry connection so that it's meaningful to do plus and minus signs. Otherwise, if we have these signs here already randomly distributed, doing a deterministic way to allocate the signs, uh, it, it, it's not reasonable. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Myers, for uh, all the answers. So we will take a, a short break, and so we will close.